قاعدين على باب البيت يعني داخلين الارض متقاومين وكانهم منفلتين عن القانون Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, Operation Shield and Arrow in full force, defending Israel from the rocket barrage coming from Gaza, some reaching as far as Tel Aviv. Plus, examining the differing connections Israeli Jews and Arabs feel about biblical Judea and Samaria, the world's most contentious real estate. And a documentary just coming out about one man's search across the desert for the real Mount Sinai. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to Jerusalem Dateline, I'm Chris Mitchell. On Friday, Palestinian Islamic Jihad fired rockets all the way to the outskirts of Jerusalem, making an immediate ceasefire unlikely. In the meantime, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu met with his security cabinet to determine what to do next. Islamic Jihad managed to fire nearly 900 rockets from Gaza. Almost 200 fell short and killed several Palestinians. While the IDF says the Iron Dome anti-missile system shot down more than 90% of the rockets coming towards populated areas. A few missiles did get through, as in the city of Ashkelon, and one Israeli died in a missile strike in the Israeli town of Rehovot. The rocket barrages did send nearly two million Israelis running for shelter, like those on this street and on the beaches of Tel Aviv. Since the beginning of the operation, nearly 60 Israelis have been treated for rocket-related injuries. Iran is the main uh, director of the initiatives of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PIJ. Uh, it's the funder. It's also the training element. Former IDF international spokeswoman Avital Leibovich says it's all part of Iran's main goal. In three out of Israel's four borders, there is Iranian presence, and I don't mean it in a positive way. I mean, Iran is trying to build some kind of a network of terror groups uh, by uh, delivering here arms, strategic weapons, different capabilities. They say it loud and clear. They don't want Israel to exist. During the several days of fighting, Hamas, the largest terror group in the Gaza Strip, stayed out of the fray. This Israeli expert explains why he believes they kept to the sidelines. He has a different agenda because he would like to have a foothold in Judea and Samaria, and in due time actually to replace Abu Mazen, the old leader of Fatah movement, and they would like to turn Hamas into the unquestionable leader of Palestine. These rocket barrages have sent millions of Israelis rushing for shelter on the side of the road, on the beaches, or in apartment buildings. One of those Israelis, Arsen Ostrovsky, described to CBN News what this ordeal has been like for him and his family. Arsen, uh, well over a million, maybe almost two million Israelis are running to bomb shelters. You and your family are one of those. Can you describe what this ordeal has been like for you and your family? 
Sure, Chris. Look, it's, it's a pretty harrowing experience. You know, we're, we're fighting terrorists on the ground. We're also trying to give people a glimpse of daily life here in Israel at the moment. And I, like so many other, uh, so many others uh, in Israel, uh, with uh, with families, with children, young ones, um, also have to uh, take care and uh, seek uh, safety ourselves. Uh, just yesterday, I was actually on the way to pick up my youngest daughter, who's only two years old, from daycare, when a siren went off, and we're in. A, I was in a car on the freeway where to get out and immediately seek cover, uh, not knowing what's going to happen. But the most harrowing part of that experience is that you're away from your family. You're away from your children. There's this sense of helplessness, you know, not not being there with them, not being able to protect them and only being able to pray at, the, at that moment that they are being looked after and are safe. So that's certainly one of the most difficult aspects of being away from your children. Um, but then also, you know, last night, like so many other millions of families across the country, we had to wake up our children and run for uh, for shelter in the stairwell of our apartment building with, with our neighbours. So it's certainly not a pleasant experience and we're definitely hoping and praying for calm. Yeah. Uh, Arsene, you're also the CEO of the International Legal Forum. How would you describe the way Israel is portrayed in the international forum and in the international media? Look, I think it's uh, what we're seeing is a uh, really a gross and systematic double standard. Uh, we're seeing one standard applied um, for Western liberal democracies as they fight terrorism, and then another standard uh, with respect to Israel when we face the same relentless terrorism from across the border. What Israel is dealing with is a pernicious, relentless terrorist organization, the Islamic Jihad. This is not some kind of charity. This is not some kind of NGO, but this is a Iranian-backed terrorist organization that is uh, really committing a double war crime, which is something that is not being mentioned enough. These terrorists are hiding behind innocent civilians in Gaza whilst indiscriminately firing against civilians in Israel. And Israel, like any country, like the United States, like any sovereign nation, has first and foremost duty to protect its citizens and do whatever necessary in order to achieve that goal. Final question, Arson. How would you describe the moral equivalency some people make between what Israel is doing, try to protect itself, and groups like Hamas or in Islamic Jihad are just firing indiscriminately into Israel. I think there is no moral equivalence, and we need to be very firm and clear about that. Um, what Israel is doing is uh, they are going above and beyond in order to minimise any kind of civilian casualty, and they are targeting specifically Islamic Jihad terrorist targets, whereas we know that the terror groups are committing, as I said, a double war crime. They are hiding behind civilians in Gaza whilst indiscriminately firing at civilians in Israel. There is no moral equivalence, and we need to be absolutely clear about that. A deadly attack on a synagogue in the North African nation of Tunisia has shaken the Jewish world. On Wednesday, Tunisian authorities say a rogue member of the National Guard opened fire on the historic Griba synagogue, killing at least five people. The victims include two Jewish men who were visiting the site during an annual pilgrimage and three members of the country's security forces. A dozen others were wounded. Authorities are investigating the motive behind the attack. The synagogue is believed to be one of the oldest on earth. Tunisia was once home to a large Jewish population, but most of them relocated to France and Israel following the rebirth of the Jewish state. Well, senior Biden advisors met with Netanyahu in Jerusalem this week amid efforts by Washington to secure a normalization deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Speaking at a conference in D.C., U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said normalization is a top priority for the Biden administration. He met with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman this week to discuss a number of Mideast issues, including normalizing ties with Israel, Axios reports. However, Riyadh doesn't appear ready to join the Abraham Accords just yet. The kingdom has presented significant demands to the White House, including a green light from Washington for a civilian nuclear program. Officials in Jerusalem tell the Israeli media the Biden administration will have a one-year window of opportunity to secure a normalization deal. Coming up, a recent poll reveals what Israelis really believe about the West Bank, Biblical Judea and Samaria. The results of a recent poll show that the often controversial West Bank or Biblical Judea and Samaria 
may not be so controversial among Israelis. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl tells us more. Thousands of years ago, the Bible called this area, Judea and Samaria, part of the land God promised to the Jewish people. Since 1967, the international community has mainly referred to it as the Occupied West Bank, where Palestinian Arabs want to establish a state. A recent survey of nearly 1,200 Jewish and Arab Israelis tried to measure how the two groups felt about this contentious real estate. What we found in this poll that was focused on Judea and Samaria is that 70% of the Jewish society are very attached to Judea and Samaria, to our heritage and our history. Reserve Brigadier General Amir Avivi heads the Israel Defense and Security Forum which conducted the poll. Breaking down the numbers, it found a big divide. In addition to the historic connection among Jewish Israelis, 63% feel an emotional connection, 48% a religious connection. By contrast, among Arab Israelis, 37% feel an historical connection, 33% an emotional connection, 32% a religious connection. More than 2.7 million Palestinians and around half a million Jewish Israelis live in Judea and Samaria. That could be changing, as Avivi says nearly 50 percent of Israelis are thinking about moving to these communities, often described as the biblical heartland. We have to understand that the area of Tel Aviv and its surroundings is already full. It's very, very expensive. It's like one big Manhattan. Uh, the young generation cannot afford buying houses in this region, so they are looking east towards the mountains because this is in the center of Israel. Much better weather, by the way. Avivi's organization, made up of 16,000 members who served in Israeli security organizations, is dedicated to keeping the country's security a national priority. We have been, in the last three years, doing extensive work with the young generation, explaining that Israel cannot exist without the Jordan Valley and Judea and Samaria. It's an area that is crucial, both spiritually physically and security-wise. And I think that this understanding is growing more and more uh, in the Israeli society. He says while the Jewish connection to this land goes back thousands of years, it's still alive today. All our existence here is a biblical prophecy that has come to be. Every day is a miracle here. And uh, I think that definitely the Jewish people here in Israel are getting really more and more attached and connected to really what it is to be a Jew in the land of Israel. And he sees this land as the future of the Jewish people and their return known as Zionism. This is really where we should settle now and in the future. The spirit of Israel is being built up, and uh, without a connection to Judea and Samaria, there is no real Zionism. Zionism is just an extension of Judaism. It's really understanding that this is the land of the people of Israel. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, against overwhelming odds, the state of Israel has not only survived, but thrived. See what this tiny nation has accomplished in 75 years. On Sunday, May 14th, the world will mark the 75th anniversary of the modern state of Israel. In 75 years, this tiny nation has seen war, triumph, innovation, and the prophetic return of the Jewish people to their biblical homeland. Today, Israel is on a path to become a world power. <laughs> Here in Independence Hall on May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared the birth of the modern state of Israel. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, the Jewish people had a nation. He chose the words, we hereby declare the establishment, it says here, of a Jewish state in the land of Israel to be known as the state of Israel. This was the birth of a Jewish state, as for all Jews. Ben-Gurion was standing here as the voice of 11 million Jews around the world who had no voice, who had no address, and nowhere to go to. Isaac Dror's mission here is to ensure the story of Israel's beginning remains alive and continues to spread. It was promised to us by God. We are the only people in the history of the world that live on the same land 
speak in the same language and believe in the same God more than 3,000 years. From a biblical perspective, many see Israel fulfilling the prophecy in the book of Ezekiel, where the dry bones of the Jewish people come to life after 2,000 years of exile. Organizations like the Jewish Agency help lay the groundwork for that 2,000 years in the making Jewish state. The Jewish Agency was the lead organization in establishing and giving birth to the modern state of Israel. The whole purpose of establishing the Jewish Agency was to, on the one hand, unite the global Jewish people and to bring the global Jewish people in front of the British mandate to be the organization that would lead and establish a national home for the Jewish people in the land of Israel. To fully comprehend the miracle of the country's birth, consider that it happened in the shadow of the Holocaust, or Shoah in Hebrew, when the world learned how Nazi Germany murdered six million Jews. When you understand uh, that only three years after the end of the Shoah, the lowest point the Jewish people reached in its exile, we started our redemption process and we regained our independence after 2,000 years of terrible events. Well, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what a miracle is. Even so, Diane dispels one myth about the connection between Israel's beginning and the Holocaust. Israel was not established because of the Holocaust. Israel was established in spite of the Holocaust. Israel would have been a much robust, greater, secure, successful country if there were additional six million Jews and their descendants in the world. But Israel is the guarantee that there will be no other Shoah for the Jewish people. Now, after 75 years, Israel maintains its safety and security with one of the most powerful militaries in the world. Then it was small units of very patriotic uh, people, some of them Holocaust survivors who just came off the boat from Europe, put on IDF uniforms and joined battle and defended Israel in 1948 against six Arab armies. Today, we are a highly organized, developed and well-funded military, uh, perhaps the strongest in the region, that enjoys a significant technological advantage over all of our enemies. Israel is also an economic miracle. This tiny country with less than 10 million people has the highest concentration of new businesses per capita in the world, earning it the nickname of Startup Nation. John Medved, founder of Our Crowd, a venture capital investment company, showcases these accomplishments at his annual investor summit. This is what Israel is supposed to be doing, right? If Israel wasn't the startup nation, so what are we going to be? Okay, I'm sorry, this is our destiny. Our destiny is to create. Our destiny is to, you know, fix the world. And we're just a little people, we make a lot of noise. But I think that most Israelis, whether they wear a yarmulke or they don't wear a yarmulke, view this as a spiritual undertaking, that we're doing this not just to make money, but to do good. Yet throughout its history, Israel has faced nearly insurmountable odds. Just hours after Ben-Gurion declared the state, Six Arab nations tried to drive it into the sea. While it survived, Israel would be challenged again in the 1967 Six-Day War and the 1973 Yom Kippur War. After thousands of years in exile and 75 years as a country, Israel stands despite enemies within, along each border and beyond. It's a modern miracle. The rebirth of the Jewish state against all odds, uh, a people that were left for dead, that had been dispersed to the four corners of, of the earth, and you saw the ancient prophecies uh, fulfilled, where you had the ingathering of the Jewish exiles, the restoration of Jewish sovereignty in modern times, against all odds. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. and now Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer tells CBN News this miracle can be seen unfolding throughout the nation. And you're seeing that happen wherever you go in Israel, whether it's in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and you saw the, all the ancient history, and then you see the startup nation. You go north, south, east, and west. Israel is a modern miracle. It is the greatest miracle of the 20th century, and maybe the greatest miracle of the last 2,000 years. Uh, Still ahead, where is the real Mount Sinai? An upcoming film examines new evidence for where Moses met with God and received the Ten Commandments.
For more than 20 years, investigative filmmaker Tim Mahoney has been in search of the real Mount Sinai described in the Bible. I talked with Mahoney about his latest film, Patterns of Evidence, Journey to Mount Sinai, Part 2. Tim Mahoney, great to be with you back on uh, CBN News, and congratulations on this new film. Tell us about finding the real Mount Sinai. Well, this investigation actually started, Chris, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, May 15th, I was in Saudi Arabia in 2003, and I have been pursuing uh, investigating the exodus, as you know, for a long time, and we're excited this is going to be in theaters on May 15th, 2023, which is next Monday, and May 17th on Wednesday in a, a national release, over 700 theaters, and we are investigating uh, three different mountains, two in Saudi Arabia, by the way, and one in Israel in the Negev, Har Karkum. And what have you found over 20 years and especially in the last few years? Well, there does appear to be a pattern of evidence, uh, which uh, both includes early Sinitic, uh, proto-Sinitic writings, which I think is early Hebrew, and we covered that in our first film, The Moses Controversy. So we have been looking in a two-film series at, you know, where is the location of Mount Sinai? And what we're finding is a, uh, a pattern of evidence for the uh, wildernesses, for the route, and we're also finding evidences at several mountains that seem to match uh, the biblical narrative of the Israelites being at Mount Sinai. One of those, interesting, is a pattern at Har Karkum in Israel. And the other one that I really like is an, at a place called Jebel Alaz, where there are pillars, altars, and uh, there's sources of water. So this is what the big investigation is. After 20 years, uh, people can participate in this uh, and, and really get a feeling of what it felt, what the Israelites might have seen when they were at Mount Sinai. Tim, why are these investigations so important? Well, right now there's a lot of criticism and a lot of people are suggesting that the events of the Bible didn't happen. You might not hear that at your church, but if you send your kids off to college uh, and into the main <laughs> stream, they're basically they're going to be told at university that, yeah, the Bible is just a, a book of fairy tales. And our films taken a very objective look and say, well, what pattern would we look for? And that's what we're looking for in this investigation, Journey to Mount Sinai 2. And what we find is an amazing pattern of evidence that actually is matching the biblical narrative. But it's not in the same places as you might think. It's in a different place. Now, you say you don't necessarily go to investigate to prove the, prove the Bible, but investigate the Bible. What do you mean by that? Well, the Bible... Uh, some people would say, well, you're just trying to prove the Bible. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to investigate the historical credibility of the Bible. And the Bible gives us a roadmap in the Exodus. It has certain uh, wildernesses that it crossed, certain campsites that it made, and there's certain distances in time. And in this particular investigation, it also has information about what happened at the mountain. So what we're doing is trying to take a very objective look and looking at different points of view. And when we look at those different points of view, we're, we're getting some people saying, well, uh, no, there's no evidence here, and here's why. But the audience then can look at this uh, big investigation, hear what we're saying about what the Bible is saying actually, and then interpret it. Uh, and that's what I think I'm trying to do is give them a roadmap. I actually created a Mount Sinai scorecard, by the way. And if people go to our, pat our website, PatternsOfEvidence.com, uh, they can get this. It has a lot of information on it, <clears throat> and it preps them for the film. And they can then have their own checklist. There's 17 different things that we're looking at in this, prep in this checklist. And that helps us to zero in on what mountain really is the true mountain of Mount Sinai. You can find out more about Mahoney's film at PatternsOfEvidence.com. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blasts so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.